Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us again another episode of the Shut Up David series. Today we've got Clive Lloyd um, to come to talk to you. Uh, a man that doesn't really need much of an introduction, uh, especially here in Australia, but um, he's going to get one anyway. I think I stole that from Steve Harvey, to be honest with you. But Clive Lloyd, Australian-based psychologist, specializing in safety leadership and culture development. He was recently named among the top five global thought leaders and influencers on health and safety by Thinkers 360. Clive assists leaders and organizations to create safe and mentally healthy workplaces where trust, engagement, psychological safety and well-being can thrive. He's particularly focused on organizational culture development through the implementation of the acclaimed Care Factor program. Please welcome Clive Lloyd. Clive. Thank you, David. How you, how are you how are you going after your your recent trip to Brazil? I know we we had a brief chat to begin with and you you're suffering yeah. a bit there, aren't you? Yeah, so just so viewers, listeners can understand why I'm uh, outdoors, it's because uh, as well as the jet lag on coming back from Brazil, uh, I also got a, a hefty case of COVID. Um, and no. so, um, yeah, I have very important people in the house who I'm trying to uh, protect from my germs. And so I've been banished, David, out into uh, the background. So you may hear Australian birds chirping away. You might see a Kelpie. Uh, or a cattle dog uh, in the background, but hey, it's all right. <laughs> I'm doing well. That's life. That's life in Australia. That's Apart from life. that, you're feeling good? I feel great. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, really awesome. happy to be on, mate. You've had some of my very good friends and associates on so far. I was listening to your episode with Josh this morning. Um, awesome. So, yeah, really happy to join that band. Awesome. Thank you. And I, I appreciate it as well. I know you're very, very busy at the moment and obviously, you know, recovering as well from your jet lag and your COVID. Okay, so why don't we, um, most people know you, let's just put it out there, but for those who don't, if you can give them like a, a 30 second, you know, one minute kind of intro as to who you are, and then we can, you know, talk about the Care Factor program, your main, your main program here. Yeah, sure. Look, um, in a simple way, I, I'm a psychologist. First and foremost, yep. I'm a psychologist. I loved psychology since the first day I started studying it until i learned actually that we had to do a lot of statistics that kind of put me off for a little while but no uh that was 30 something years ago yeah. when i first started studying i loved it then i love it now and um look my intent really back then was never to move into the um the safety space health yes I, i've always worked in the health space but yeah. I, and, and maybe we'll get to this but i was kind of dragged into safety kicking and screaming really um <laughs> but ever since, um look i, I love the humanistic uh, schools of thought in psychology and from my perspective they were lacking somewhat in organizations and I had yep. the opportunity I guess um, some 20 odd years ago to to look at applying uh, some of the cognitives more of the humanistic and positive psychology elements to organizations and uh, we just found it made a real difference yep. and so yep. uh, I've just been doing that ever since so I see again in few words I love humanizing uh, organizations yeah. not that i'm saying many are inhuman um yeah. but just doing what we can to actually humanize because everything just works better that way so in yeah. a nutshell mm -hmm. david that's what i do that's <coughs> awesome excuse me and uh no that's no, so all good and um i love that i was i was talking to sam goodman earlier on as well and um we were talking about how placing the people back into their rightful place in the center of the organization it, it's not just a safety thing it's a it, it's a it's a humanistic thing it's a performance thing it's a communications thing it's the most important thing it's to have the have the people in their rightful place in the sense where they belong not overrun by process and systems and technologies and everything else which is which is obviously important but having the people still back in there so I, you know it really resonates with me that um yeah um okay so you mentioned that you got dragged kicking and screaming into safety <laughs> how does how, how does that come about yeah and, and look occasionally i might be coughing here right no um, it's thankfully the the germs won't make it down the microphone <laughs> so look, when i say drag kicking and screaming my background even though i've been working with organizations now for 30 years right yeah my background is not organizational psychology 
it's it's actually clinical and counseling psychology so we have a bit in common here david i don't know if you're sort of big in that not counseling but coaching right there's a lot of overlap yes. there too there is um and so look at the time i was um really working in a field that uh has its own dangers and that is the field of addictions yep. and i was the clinical director of the gold coast drug council here and um the, this is just the nature of addictions from time to time we lose people and yep. uh it fell to me as the leader um to sit with the affected family members and really you know difficult but important conversations after yep. we we lost somebody and so when it came time as often happens with people with a clinical background we started private practice i was kind of known for grief counseling to a degree and as soon as that happened uh, i was approached a lot from organizations directly but also through eap providers to go to mine sites oil and gas plants construction sites after a fatality or yeah, after right. a very serious injury that was my uh again my welcome if you will to uh, the field of organizational safety and a pretty brutal introduction it is and it so, is you got you got right oh, in the deep end right in the deep end and a few things shocked me straight away was was first up how frequently those events occurred you know, pr previous to that i had no real idea of that but secondly how these organizations actually looked at the whole motion of keeping people safe and as a psychologist then it just surprised me and going back to our introduction there um a lot of it was not um focused on doing safety with people this was back in the 90s right so right in the midst of behaviorism behavior based safety um, yep. and so forth and for me i'm kind of shaking my head thinking guys like we moved on from behaviorism in the 1950s you know yeah. and it was really interesting when i was writing my book i spoke to david proven who i know you know yep. and uh in our conversation he said it, it seems that safety is about 30 years behind um related disciplines like psychology and that stuck with me and i still think it's absolutely true like we're we're in the midst now of hop right yep hop seems to be the big one i think of hop in, incidentally as uh, humanistic um operational principles that's just how i've seen it hops about 30 years old right uh, it's yep. it's now gaining great traction which i welcome but it, it's not new it's been around for 30 years um in the 80s 90s yeah behaviorism behavior based safety became incredibly popular that died in the 50s and so it's like this 30 year gap between the psychological knowledge and research and and what safety applies and yep. so when i first started that yeah that's where I'm, I'm scratching my head and thinking why are you doing this with or actually two people you know they'd all be doing behaviorism they would uh, have language like um obviously investigations after the incident but uh violations offenders breaches of golden rules and i remember thinking like if your goal is to bring your people along on this journey with you like <laughs> that's not yeah. language i would be using so that started a whole thing within me of um i, I reckon i can do some good work here um yeah. humanizing how they approach that not to you know hopefully not to be disrespectful to anything they're doing everything they're doing is done with a great intent still is yeah. has always been yeah but gee you know we're we were a long way behind uh where the research suggests yeah 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 and i like i i really like that because what you effectively decided to do back then was to use psychology as a bedrock as a foundation for humans which ironically enough are in every single working system that exists today to some degree yeah. so you 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 obviously had that training in the clinical side of things and the counseling side of things but you had that understanding from a psychological viewpoint as well and thought why are we not applying the same meta principles and effect into the safety realm and it's something similar to what's going on in the coaching world at the moment as well with with the uh you know the advent of positive psychology and all these are the all these are the tenants that yeah. are coming in you know um solution focused as well um cb elements of cbt they yeah. they are being they are being um uh not extracted but they're being borrowed yeah. from the tenants yeah. of psychology and they're being utilized by by coaching as well to get better results um yeah. and it sounds like you that you know back in the 90s and the early 
early 2000s, that was your mindset around safety and how it could benefit from the tenants of psychology. Is that fair? It is. Um, in fact, mate, you got me thinking right there. Just, just following that timeline of the various psychological principles and models that have come through the, the eras. Uh, and you mentioned positive psychology there, for example. Um, yeah, when I first went in to the, the safety field, yeah, again, behaviorism was the go. And if you, if you follow the timeline of psychology, especially if you're looking at the clinical and counseling elements, you know, you can go way back to uh, psychodynamic, the Freudian, or before that, by the way, it's phrenology, right? Literally feeling for bumps in people's heads. Um, yeah, right. Past that fairly quickly. Um, but yeah, the, the psychodynamic aspects, if you will, the, the Freudian, the neo Freudian, which some really interesting things grew out of, then that was largely, um, well, there was a huge opposition to that from behaviorists because they're saying you're looking at all this internal stuff and really we're just interested in observable behaviors. That is, yep. um, you know, what you see literally the observable and then rewarding or punishing that to shape behaviors. And again, they went to the other extreme and people like Watson and Skinner literally said, we do not care what's going on in here. Thoughts and feelings. Yeah, forget it. We're not interested. Just observable behaviors. So that was, a you know, started to uh, be rebelled against again in the 1950s by the people who said, hang on, there's, there's more to us than the things drive that. So that led to like, yeah. the cognitive sciences, which yeah. at least recognized that uh, and this is where the, the, the links with hop, right? Context matters. And so yes. the behaviors come from places. The humanistic yep. movement, you know, Carl Rogers and so forth, big fan of that, actually putting people forward. Um, and so, you know, cognitive sciences was big when I was studying, but then the movement towards positive psychology, Seligman's work and so forth. And you look at safety and how that's evolving, as well as coaching. Yep. Um, and, and what is hop? if not really applied, well, positive psychology applied to safety. You know, instead yeah. of, well, safety too, actually. Safety too is looking at, don't worry so much about what goes wrong, focus on what goes right. Well, it was yes. positive psychology 30 years ago. Yeah. In yes, other words, exactly, which is why I wrote that article about it, which is, it, yeah. it just aligns so perfectly, didn't it? It, it aligns perfectly. Um, so, you know, there, there's a whole, the, the thing though at the heart of this for me, and again, this is where I bring the clinical lens in. Sorry to wrap it on. It's what I do when you no, no, started. No, no, no. no. Um, there was, in, in the early days of study, you know, he had a bunch of very eager psychology students wanting to learn. I, I was one of them. And we do learn about all of those various modalities, psychodynamic, behavioral, cognitive, positive, all that stuff. And um, one particular lecture, uh, we were talking about all the different models. And the, the, the lecturer said, right, homework is to go through all the models, come with a position tomorrow to the uh, tutorial and um, talk about your favorite, why it's your favorite and which is your least favorite. <laughs> all right, and you got us in small groups. Um, so put your stake in the ground and defend it. Your stake in the ground. And man, um, within 10 minutes, these little groups were getting pretty feisty, right? With the people really attached to their models. It, it was like a LinkedIn thread. <laughs> um, and people, you know, I, I thought the biff was going to start. Anyway, he lets it go for a little while, I suspect quite deliberately. And then he pulls us up. He says, right, stop. Right. Before we go any further, let's have a look at what actually predicts successful outcomes which let's face it is rather important. Yeah. And then he said, the model that you use, any model that you use in terms of predicting success is way, way down the list to the point of insignificance. And we're all looking around thinking, what the hell are we arguing yeah, about? Yeah. But the question then was, well, what's at the top of the list? Yeah. You know, what, what actually does predict success? And this has stuck with me ever since. And he said, that's the, what we call the therapeutic alliance or if you will, the trusting alliance okay. forever. That has been at the very top of the list. And he said, frankly, if you don't have that, it, whatever model you use, it doesn't really matter. If you do have that, then any um, model is likely to, um, or more likely to gain traction. And so unsurprisingly, most um, clean psychs, most counseling psychologists, they're eclectic in their approach. In other words, they don't rely on a single model. Depending yep. on the client's context and circumstances, they will draw from 
the various models available with them with the full collaboration integration with the client then good can be done now again i took that lens to psychology because uh, to safety because exactly the same thing happens yep. we can argue safety one safety two no, they were never meant to be against each other but that's a whole other topic um yep. hop safety do behavior based and again there is no reliable consistent evidence to predict that one model does any better than yep. another um what though the research again is very clear about is if you don't have that trusting alliance with your workforce pretty much nothing else you do is going to make a difference anyway and so that was what was driving me in the early days let's get that first let's form yep. that trusting alliance <coughs> excuse me when we've done that yes we all have our favorites david mine include things like hop for various reasons then if you do that first you're likely to gain traction um, i've seen all too common now because hop is so popular people go off a little bit half cocked they get out there trying to declutter um, or doing learning teams <coughs> and the workforce is scratching their heads so yep. up to this point it's been boot camp you know yep. you watch our behaviors you punish us when we're wrong now all of a sudden you're coming to us expecting us to have all the answers and yep. um they've fallen flat yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes you only get one great opportunity to, to actually do this stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, if we haven't first created that climate, yep. then uh, sometimes a lot of time and money is, is wasted on an intervention that goes nowhere. Yeah. I was talking to, uh, actually, what you just mentioned then reminded me of two things. The first <coughs> thing was your, and I always remember your post on LinkedIn, enough nasal, navel gazing let's get over this and i i call it try it's not me that calls tribalism it comes across to me as yeah. tribalism it's kind of it's that stake in the ground like as you were a student you know people feel they have to defend their their yeah. viewpoint their their methodology for approaching safety and they it has to be better than everybody else's whereas what we need to do is elevate above that because that model is not, as you mentioned, it, that's not the important part. It's the trust. It, yeah. It's the relationships that you build. It's the communications you can have. It's the it's the interactions you have with humans. That's the meta. That's the meta. Um, that's the meta goal, really. And everything else comes in beneath that. I think that's Absolutely. what you were talking about there. And it also it may be a good time actually to bring um, up onto the screen your book because also as and I know you. You put a lot of posts on linkedin which are extracts from the book as well which are really appreciated by the way because they remind me to go back to my my copy of the book and reread certain parts and everything like that but another quote which um sticks with me a lot when thinking about this type of stuff is a quote that you use and i think we I think we spoke about it on linkedin about a week ago i tried to quote you and i got it wrong so i always get caught wrong but unless there is trust then every other um um, anything else you try to do is going to fall on deaf ears. Essentially, you can probably correct me on that quote, but yeah. Uh, look, you're right. If, if I go through the quote, and again, this isn't just my opinion. This this is some very robust research. Yeah. Um, some some great Australian research actually that was done through ANU, and one of the concluding um, phrases of that um, study was, uh, and I'm going to try and get this wrong, uh, David. And then, and then <laughs> the mistrust. That is, unless the mistrust of the workforce can be overcome, even right. the most well-intentioned and sophisticated management initiatives will be treated with cynicism and undermined. That's an actual quote from that study. And right. that that was back in 2012, but it mirrored what I'd been finding. And, you know, I'd been doing it pre-Decker, pre-Safety Differently, but it, it yep. struck me as absolutely the case. And what we were saying earlier, unless you have overcome mistrust, nothing you do is going to gain much traction and it was so frustrating to me because i'd travel from place to place and if the organization had somewhat of a, a reactive culture if i can put it in that way yep um you know they'd maybe had a spike in injuries for example what do they do well they react and it's quick bring in do something right do yeah. something yeah yeah um, it might be bringing in dupont or a shiny new behavior based safety program whatever it is and they rolled that out to a reluctant workforce. And what are the reluctant workforce thinking? Um, well, here we go again, eh? 
yeah. management's latest attempt to fix us because clearly we're the problem. And the all problem. I've been trying to say since 2012 is stop. Um, get the basics right first. Where there's that, those pockets of mistrust, or it might be wider, but uh, first assess that. We, we've been able to do that um, in incredibly reliable and valid formats. We can actually test for that and actually point out where the areas are of mistrust and what we can do about that. Once that's looked at, then, yeah, we can bring in what we like. And yes, yep. I, we have favourites, don't we, David? My favourites do tend to be the more humanistic approaches. Um, so things that would fall into that category would include positive psychology or hop, if you will. Um, yep. But again, uh, we don't. that's not just what we do. We, we'll bring in, believe it or not, uh, occasionally even maybe some behavioural aspects um, and so forth. We're eclectic in our approach, believe it or not. But we know nothing is going to work unless we've got that that solid base of trust first. Well, is that is that one of the reasons why? I mean, this book that you wrote, "A Next Generation of Safety Leadership from from Compliance to Care," it's it's literally it's saying a, everything they that you've just said. Then, isn't it? It's it's yeah. it's it's using that psychological foundation. And going, this is where we need to really spend most of our time, because everything yeah. else, everything else is everything else is peripheral and can change. Is oh, it's almost dare we say it, context driven as to which yeah. type of model that you want to use. But this is the most important thing, which has to be the same regardless of where your organisation is situated in the world and what you do. Unless you have that trust, then you don't have the constitutional part that's going to give you the benefit of any model that you decide to put on top of it that's exactly right without that foundation nothing will gain traction nothing can get embedded and again the other big thing i've learned in the last 20 years of doing this work is unless you can embed positive change uh this is just a human condition we will go back to what we did before because we're yep. wired away. <laughs> creatures uh, creatures of habit Nope. It goes that way. Yeah. Uh, so this was the number one on, uh, in Amazon's best-selling list, wasn't it? Yeah, around the world, actually. Yeah, and, and still is occasionally, even though it's, uh, what, three years old, four years old now. Must be very proud of it. Um, I guess I am, yeah. It's funny, when I wrote it, um, you know, I didn't have a lot of time. It was so, therefore, I wrote it quite quickly, actually, and... Um, as soon as I submitted it to the publisher, COVID hit. And what that meant, David, is I could have taken another six months to write it. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, the, the great news is a lot of uh, readers have commented they love the fact that it is short because leaders yep. are really busy, right? And so it's punchy, right? It's short and it's punchy. Um, and, yeah, it, it's it's pretty practical too. So, yeah, I think it's um, it's just helped a lot of people see, regardless of what we need to do, what frameworks we want to introduce to our teams we need to get this right first yep. not just about safety by the way this is about general organizational change you know yeah. you cannot a performance. expect a performance this is about high performing teams and organizational change you cannot yep. you cannot even hope for those to gain traction without the same foundations you could almost take the word safety out of that book right I sometimes say, you know, I've given a few talks on Hop. Um, some of them are actually on YouTube as well. And if you listen to the end, you'll hear me say, and I didn't even mention the word safety, because yeah. safety safety is a side effect of things working correctly. If Absolutely. you concentrate on on having things working correctly and people communicating properly, then safety safety will come. But the more you, it's a, it's almost like when you concentrate really hard on driving you actually do some of your worst driving. And, and that's the same effect, really, when we when we start talking about safety. But um, so would you, um, is this book your book? Is this something that, that you would um, prescribe to an organization if they come to you and say, look, we've heard about the care factor. Um, it's something that we're really interested in. We don't know where to start. Is this is this a good book for, for organizations to give to their senior leaders to say, look, you know, this is this is where we're trying to aim for? Yeah, in, in several different contexts. So first up, we, we often get inquiries from organisations, you know, they, they want to know what the Care Factor program is about. That's a bit of a longer conversation. But I'll often say uh, for a very minimal investment, just get the e-book or the Kindle, 
Um, by the time you finish reading that book, if you think it's a load of garbage, then the Care Factor program is probably not for you. Uh, if you think... Cool. You know, that's, that's where... Is as part part of their embedding that having a bit of network issues there clive um seems ah. to be dipping and um, dipping in and out we i think we caught you when you said um if they read the book and they think it's rubbish and the care factor program won't be for them yeah that's it yeah if the book was a waste of their time in their minds then it's it's unlikely they'll be ready for the care factor program um conversely if they read the book and have the thought that uh yeah you know what i can see how this could really help this approach could really help then we've got a good platform to actually um move further the other interesting aspect is that um organizations even if they haven't read the book after their leaders have been through the care factor program they'll often use the book as an part of their embedding um, you might have noticed at the end of every chapter, there is a um, series of reflection questions and ways yep. forward. They get all their leaders to actually reflect on each chapter, spell out the next steps. That alone becomes, um, you know, part of the part of the action plan to embed. So it's been useful yep. in a number of different contexts. Yeah. Do you find um, the support for senior leadership, well, or for leadership at any particular level throughout this process? Um, is critical to actually get changes embedded absolutely uh in fact the more i look at it um even the buy-in of the board is important um i still think the biggest change you get is from the operational leaders those frontline supervisors they have the most impact on the uh the well-being of their teams but if they don't feel like they're going to be backed in this approach by their managers yeah. Um, it's less likely to happen. Equally, though, if those managers don't believe the board are going to be supportive of change, again, it, it tends to flow down. No big surprises there. Um, yeah. I think some of the best leaders that I've worked with, even if they recognise there's reluctance to change at the board level, because let's face it, boards are conservative by nature, yeah. they will often, though, act as a buffer um from the stuff that goes on above them and actually t just work with their teams they still have a major impact by applying many of the concepts we discussed yeah right okay well that's what leaders should be doing really as well isn't it that's they right. they should be protecting people you know below them around them as well you know from the effects from above so what impact so <clears throat> how do you find let's say for example an organization comes to you um they're not necessarily reactive, but they're not necessarily, um, you know, in the, I, I suppose what would be the better end of reactive would be responding, proactive, you know, for, proactive, you know, thoughtfully responding. They're not there either. Um, and, you know, they want to start with the care factor program and you, and they've read your book um, and they're in alignment with that. What would be yeah. the steps that they that you would take them on? What would be the process of going through the Care Factor program with the organisation? And again, it, it differs from different clients. Um, it's not a bespoke. You, David. Yep, I'm here. I'm just seeing there were some difficulties with the network there, so I'm just pausing. Yeah, um, no, good have, on you. Have I, have I got you? Yeah, and you if I see that happen, I'll pause. Good. Awesome. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm onto it already, mate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm guessing you can edit this or we can just keep go, keep it going. As just keep it going. Um, it's life. It's what happens. keep it going. That's life, mate. That's exactly yep. right. So uh, the Care Factor program is not off the shelf. It's bespoke for every client. Um, so after the initial discussions, and we want to be clear about the goals of the organisations. You know, we don't come in with our own goals. Um, usually, though, there's a period of assessment. Um, and so we'll actually um, utilize, we've, we've got a, a wonderfully reliable, valid and benchmarked um, survey that we do right across the workforce that um, really allows us to look at each area of the organization where trust and mistrust might exist, as yep. well as perceptions about safety leadership, um, safety processes and procedures. So a really, really good survey up front. Then we'll obviously discuss the results. 
that will can help I, us to go ahead. Can I um, just to reinforce a point here? You mentioned the word benchmarked. Um, now I know what that means, but for people who don't know yeah. what that means, could you elaborate on that? Yeah. Brilliant. Great, great thought. So we've been doing this a long, long time now across multiple um, industries, a lot high risk, but also these days increasingly we're working in the financial sectors, um, food production, beverages and so forth. And so thousands of respondents among hundreds of different industries or organisations within many, many industries. So we're able now to um, have normative data. Um, yep on these various industries. And so we can apply this normative data to a new client. So, you know, not to beat ourselves up or, or to pat ourselves on the back, but just roughly to say, industry norm would be sitting about level this level here. And you're currently, at least in this aspect, level two, in this aspect, maybe level four. Now that yep. data really helps us to give a bespoke version of the Care Factor program tailoring it to what is really where they're going to get the biggest bang for the buck the biggest potential change maybe what they don't need so much of and yep. so what we'd historically do there is we would work with the very senior leaders first and roll the senior leaders sometimes we get we get the opportunity to work at, at board level not all that often david and when we do <laughs> work, it's usually you know fairly short yeah, um, yeah. Any, anything is better than nothing and then yep. largely we'd roll out the leadership care factor program followed by the embedding activities, the coaching behind that. When we're all satisfied that leaders get it, they can they are now able to make the changes. So again, if you apply hop to this, they would understand the benefits of things like learning teams and things like decluttering. But if nothing else, of doing safety with people instead of two people. And yeah, so yeah. once we're satisfied that's the changes are embedded, then we look at the frontline supervisors, we do the same things with them. We pause again. We're sure they've got it. That's when we progress to the actual workforce themselves. And so we actually make sure that they have a deep, a thorough understanding of what it is and what is about to happen. And we're just very, very good at getting that buy-in from the workforce. You know, we've learned over the years. Yep. Um, and so once everybody's come together, then there's quite a number of embedding activities just to make sure it's going to go on. Ongoing coaching, we're required, of course. But yeah, it's it's a bespoke approach. Yep. But I believe you always start with um, getting clear about goals, going back to coaching, right? Um, yep. Let's get clear about the yeah. goals. Without that, you're going <laughs> to miss the mark. But then yep. the assessment period for us is really important. And of course, for... Um, for our own and the organization's accountability, we would often do another round of assessment um, you know, towards the end. In fact, we don't do immediate uh, assessment immediately after the program because you get the feel good effect. You know, that's not reliable data. We'd usually let that all settle for about six months and then reassess and see where we are. So that's a nutshell version, mate. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that's. Um... Okay, so you're you're literally embedded in in the organisation. You're working at every every level within your organisation in order. So, what type of timescale are we talking? I mean, and I know this is going to depend on lots of different factors: size of the organisation, location of the organisation, your availability to to leaders, and all, all, all that kind of stuff. Let's take a medium um, a medium sized organisation in Queensland, not too far yeah. from you, with say five hundred employees. What yeah. would what would a typical, uh, I don't want to say rollout, because I know it's not a rollout, um, but what would a typical integration or implementation yeah. look like? So for, for 500, um, and again, th there are elements that are effectively a rollout, but you know, we'd only roll out once we're, we've really sort of uh, got the bespoke version. The assessment um, period alone would probably count for a month because you've got to get everyone surveyed, then debrief that and actually go through the meetings. Once we've done that, though, and once the program's there, we can actually roll out reasonably quickly the actual training modules themselves. We're quite a big team, David. And so we can do concurrent workshops. We can run sort of three leadership modules, three or four a week, using several facilitators at one time. So we could actually roll out that, that, that aspect of the program probably within three months. Yep. Yeah, so okay. not, not a long period of time. A big team you mentioned, and as I've seen on LinkedIn, growing by the day as well. Yeah, um, look, what we're doing now is what we probably should have done <laughs> uh, probably a decade ago. We've we've <laughs> always had a large facilitation team, but what we didn't have is the front end. 
uh, and that is, you know, people running the business. So it's, you know, I, I'm part owner in the business. So, um, but of course, I'm out there doing it a lot. So I didn't have a lot of time to work on the business. We have now brilliant yeah, yeah. people like Steve and Amber, yeah. who came on board this week, looking after that aspect, just guiding and running the business so that the people who do the facilitation are just free to do that. And yeah. um, that's just made our growth much more manageable. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely not not working on the business working in the business yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay um and i know that this is the topic that we talked about just before coming on and we've touched on it several times throughout this conversation but it's this it's this idea of psychology being the foundation of what everything else is built on top of how how difficult is it to get that I'll not get the message across, but how difficult is it for for people to adopt that different um, yeah. mindset that's needed for uh, um, you know the types of communication? You know, to not be not instinctively jump to blame, to actually become aware of their biases, whatever they are, if they do have biases around around safety or performance. You know how yeah. how difficult how how difficult is that, and what do you do in order to be able to to help them get through that? Yeah, it's a great question. And look, uh, gratifyingly, one of the strongest pieces of feedback myself and, and our team get is how we're able to take, let's face it, sometimes quite complex psychological theory yep. um, and make it really straightforward to understand and then meaningful to apply. You yeah, know, we've right. been at this for a long time now, but that is a skill set in itself. Um, the first thing we do, uh, and there's a good reason for this, is we explain the what and the why of every principle that we talk about because if people don't understand clearly what it's all about and why it's important you can't really expect buy-in if no. you've done a good job of the what and the why then of course we move to the how and the how is this is where um you know this is back to the human brain you know the human brain just wants to do what it's always done it doesn't like learning new things essentially <laughs> and so there there has to be some great coaching around that and engagement for example, one of the tools we use, and this is harking back to almost psychodynamic theory. Again, we'll draw from whatever works. We're pragmatic in that approach. Um, <laughs> transactional analysis is the jargon. You, you'd be familiar with this in coaching, right? Yeah. Uh, we talk about parent, adult, child ego states and what the communication sounds like. From yep. e thinking the internet just looked like it died there. So I just paused. <laughs> I'm yep. hoping it's back now. <laughs> You're on the ball. You're um, on the ball, Clive. My my computer is giving me some clues here, David. It gives me the wheel of death. And so <laughs> whenever I see the wheel of death, I'm just, I'm just gonna pause till it goes away. Good so, on you. For example, we've we've used TA transaction for years. Um it's it's not new, but I tell you, if you really want people to be able to implement hop, we need to be able to speak adult to adult as opposed to what we've done historically in safety which is very parent child yeah now nobody's going to get that overnight they can learn all about hop or safety differently but that doesn't mean they know how to communicate um from a different ego state as it were they exactly, need to yeah. understand what that looks and sounds like they need it modeled for them they need a new vocabulary in some cases yeah. and Examples. so we um we're able to actually really give them what it looks and sounds like quite literally role model that role play that um and again that comes through then embedding and when yep. everyone in that team gets used to the new ways of communicating then it can gain traction but if you just yep. say now nah, you know just do learning teams ask lots of really great questions um and do safety with your people anyway have a good day yeah <laughs> that's it. it it's not going anywhere because yeah, people yeah, will yeah. just revert especially under times of stress or duress which yeah. happens a lot um, people yeah. just revert. No, it's it's got to be embedded as a way of communicating. Yeah, and what I I found as well, I don't um, I don't know whether you find the same. If the more people that are aware of the new language, the new lexicon, the new parlance, whatever you call that's going to be used, the the more people that are there to support and hold other people accountable when they're not right. um, actually upholding those, you know, the new 
language, as it were, or the new approach as well. So that's what I was picking up when you were talking there, getting everybody in and educating everybody at the same time so that everyone supports everybody yeah. else. It's not just one person trying to remember, okay, I've got this emotive state now, I'm angry. Oh, but that's right. I've got to turn that off and I now have to blah, blah, blah. It, it's it's everybody. It's everybody being involved in the process as well. Oh, is he it is, and it, that's a really uh, important point. Uh, have I gone again? No, it's all good. You're here. Um, <laughs> am I back? Yep. Still back. Um, it's a really important point. It's that critical mass, right? Yeah. Uh, and once yeah. we cross a certain threshold, we get the critical mass in the change of language and the philosophy that drives that different language. That's when the magic can start to happen. Yeah, right. Okay. Who is it, who is it that usually reaches out to you, Clive? And I don't mean people's names but like what level of the organization usually reaches out to you uh that actually varies a lot um it might be for example um uh, a frontline supervisor um and, and often it's people who went through the care factor program with a different organization um apart right. from what i what i do on linkedin we're not good at marketing mate we've never done marketing <laughs> Uh, we're psychologists. <laughs> we're not business people. But word of mouth is is actually where we get most of our work from, which is yeah, right. probably it's a probably sad indictment on our marketing, but it's it's a really great recommendation <laughs> on our work, right? So let's say this this frontline supervisor worked at a mine site, did the Care Factor program, had success with it. He's now working in a different or in a different mining company. He will often then. Um, phone me up to see if I would talk then with his safety manager, for example. Uh, I'd say most frequently it's people in safety leadership roles that we, we get phone calls from. Occasionally board members. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, occasionally board members. Uh, some people maybe have been at a conference. Um, lots of people read the book, of course, get in touch from that. Um, but it, it, sometimes it's not about safety at all. Um, yeah. And increasingly, um, people are realizing that hop is the, the word safety is not in hop, right? Yeah, no, it's not. Uh, and again, my definition of that again, humanistic um, operational principles that's not safety, that's just the way we actually operate as an organization or as a team. And so, a lot yeah. of the work we do with the care factor is not about safety at all, increasingly. Uh, it's yeah. just about setting, um, setting up the climate where high performing teams exist, they just happen to be safer high-performing yeah. teams at, at the same time. So in short, mate, yeah, those inquiries come from a wide range of yeah. people, but m most frequently, I guess, from, from people in safety leadership roles. Yeah, right. And, you know, there's many, many companies out there spending uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in marketing would love more referrals from word of mouth. So I think, uh, I think you're probably, I think, I think you're probably doing the right thing there in relation to that. Um, we we're, we're 43 44 minutes and i know we've spoke a lot about psychology and there's something that that i wanted i want to touch on as well which is the opposite end of psychology just quickly before we wrap this up um and talk about ai because it's a very topical topic at the moment um mm -hmm. how do you see that either um assisting um uh, um you know the care program safety in general or how do you see it hind or is it a hindrance in your in your mind? I'm just pausing here, mate, because I lost you there. You you became oh, all right, okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, mate. Yeah, I was no, just asking uh, I was asking if you, you see AI as a as a help or a hindrance. So in short, both. Um, and I think like so many aspects of um, the internet. Um, it comes down to its the intent of its use, um, how it is used. Uh, the, the one inevitability here is uh, it's here to stay. Uh, yep. It's going nowhere. Um, I've had a look at it. I've had a try at it. Um, I actually got it to do a review of my book, right? And oh, right. Uh, I didn't prime it um, in a positive or negative way. I just said, please review Next Generation Social Leadership. And it came back with this amazing review. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> and um, and then I, I actually sort of, I wrote a bit of an article manually, as it were. And then I got AI to say, you know, rewrite this, make it better, basically with a few prompts. 
And I didn't yep. like what it came up with at all. I just didn't no? like that. No. And I, I can spot now AI articles on LinkedIn. And they they have some commonality in their factors. Look, it's here to stay. Naturally, it's going to have some really, really positive um, applications. And I think there are probably going to be some heinous negative applications oh, too. Yeah, definitely. So I, I guess um, at the moment, I'm fairly agnostic in terms of positive, negative. Um, it's one thing, it's here to stay, and we will need to be all over it to understand where it can help. So yes. uh, it's something we're watching. It's something we're monitoring very closely. Right. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you for that. So, um, in the spirit of marketing and technology, uh, before we before we lose you, uh, let's um, have a quick look at your website so we can direct people to the best place to go to to find information and to. Um, uh, get in touch with you if they if they want further information so the, sure. here we've got your website um and this is your landing page i've had a quick look through here myself but if someone's coming here for the very first time where would you point them to and what um yeah um look frankly uh, what i'd suggest is if you really want to um, have a chat probably just get in touch with us first uh, it's that's always going to be better than a website i, I believe uh, the website, just go to the landing page and uh, have a look just to read about what the Care Factor program is about. It's due a rewrite, I'll say that. It needs a, an update urgently. Um, but still, you know, it will point you to the, the general philosophies, who we've worked with, um, the, the general approach of the Care Factor program. It does run through some of the basic modules. There's a lot of articles on that. There's, uh, so, yeah, I'd go to the landing page, but I'd, I'd get straight on to what you've had just a brief read just get in touch straight away through that page. Yep. Yep. And there's a few of your Lately articles in here. Just well. email us. We will very, very quickly. Yeah. We'll very quickly uh, make an appointment for you to speak to Steve, our managing director or myself, um, so that we can, we can give you very current up-to-date information. I more than anything, I recommend uh, just using the website to actually have a room. Uh, you're going to, there you go. Yeah. Are you back? Am I back? Yeah, you're back now. <laughs> oh, mate, it's been it's been a bit of a rocky road, but I wanted to get I wanted to get one last quick question in, and you're probably going to know who who asked who told me to ask you this one before you disappear. Is any chance of you any chance you knocking out a tune on the guitar for us? <laughs> I'll bet that was Steve Harvey. Uh, <laughs> and look, my guitars are in there. And, and you can't go in there. Putting my I've face heard, mask on. I've, I've heard, I've heard through the grapevine, Mister Lloyd, that that you're a bit of um, you're a bit of a um, a pro on the old guitar. Yeah. Well, I used to be pro. Um, oh. Until until bloody psychology got in the way, mate. Um, <laughs> yeah, from a pretty young age, uh, music is what I did for for many many years. Um, but it became apparent fairly quickly that uh, with a young family. Um, it's not the most reliable of industry, shall we say? Um, it didn't pay the bills. It didn't pay the bills, but um, I still play now. I still play gigs. Um, these days, it's a bit more jazz. In my old days, it was more rock and roll and blues and stuff like that. But yeah, still love to play, mate. Steve knows that. How the man changes, the music changes too. <laughs> That's right. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, Clive. Thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you get better soon. Um, it's no fun having that, that COVID. But um, I, no, again, I really do appreciate it. And um, I ask this of all my guests as well. But um, if in a couple of weeks, a couple of months time, whatever you want to come back on and you talk about anything, you know, any specifics or any particular programs or initiatives, and it would be, it'd be an honor to have you on. And I would welcome the opportunity, David. And next time, we'll guarantee that the uh, the internet connection is more stable. <laughs> <laughs> That's it there. All right. Well, um, also, if you're ever over here in Perth again, I know you were over here in a couple of weeks ago, weren't you? So um, yeah. it'd be good to catch up with you if you're over here next time as well. But anyway, all the best. And thank you again. I will, uh, I will, I will see you around on LinkedIn most probably. I'll put a LinkedIn post up as well um, with a link to this video so people have that. And his... Uh, the Care Factor Just Consulting, um, that's going to be down there in the description as well. Go down to the description. There's going to be a link to Amazon for the book, 
the website, and I'll probably put a link in there to his LinkedIn profile as well. So you've got a, several ways of getting in contact with, with Clive should you need further information. But uh, once again, thank you very much for your time, Clive. Thank you for having me, Dave. It's been a pleasure. Really good chat. Thank you. Thank you.